Watch Dogs is the latest in Ubisoft's incredibly rapidly growing line of AAA free roaming games alongside the Assassin's Creed and Far Cry series. These series are a joint initiative to homogenize every time and place in human history into a set of basic principles with one or two gimmicks to set them apart. Each are characterized by a mixture of stealth gimmicks alongside a rather easy action game, an open world map with very delineated territories where you unlock more content by fucking with a tower of some kind. It takes the design principles of Assassin's Creed and Far Cry and pops them onto a third person shooter. It came out in May of this year, or if you're on the Wii U, it still isn't out whenever you're watching this. And then that happened. And I've got to say, that really fucked with my joke. It was halfway through writing the script when they announced this. There was immediate hate piled onto this game because it was average. Well, that and years of hype and build up. And delays which they said were to further polish the game. And a review embargo to impede people making informed choices. I wasn't in on the backlash. I didn't have any hype for Watch Dogs, at least not on the same level that quite a few people did. Because I actually play Assassin's Creed, and they're basically my popcorn flicks. I don't expect the world. At this point, I expect basic competency at best. And along the way, I hope for them to somehow write something stupider than using the former protagonist's brain to develop video games. Basically, I didn't think Ubisoft would really deliver anything half as good as what they were promising with Watch Dogs. And I was more right than I could have known. I really do not like Watch Dogs. It's safe, unchallenging, and overall astoundingly average. Now, average isn't typically that painful, but this piece of average lasts for over 10 hours. Another problem is the PC version, which is what I'm working with. It's not a great port by any stretch of the word. For one thing, the graphics were gimped for console parity. I'm more a frame rate bloke than a graphics bloke, but there's slowdown at quite a few points as well. There is a community made patch that gives us graphics and effects closer to the E3 demo that tricked people in the first place, while also optimizing the bloody thing to make it run better, or so I've heard. But I will not be using this. I'm going to play the game the way Ubisoft intended, which sadly and kind of beautifully makes this review actually unfair on them. It also sadly means that I now have Steam Origin and fucking you play on my system. Look, it's like a scale of best to worst. I got about part way through the first act of the game before deciding to review it. I thought I'd be able to play through the game once, start over, and then start recording footage for the review. At some point I just couldn't force myself to keep playing, but the review stayed in the back of my mind for a little bit. I knew this would be the next thing after my last review. So, when I restarted the game I basically forced myself through the whole game for the sake of recording it because my time is less valuable than even you know. But the fact that I had to force myself through the review kind of tells you how I feel about this game right off the bat. The game opens up with a couple of hackers knocking about in a hotel called the Merlot. The man under that iconic cap who is dressed like a cross-dimensional concept of being inconspicuous is our protagonist, Aiden Pierce. His highest honour, and indeed the most interesting part about him, is the fact that open offices spell check will refuse to accept either part of his name. His job is to stand still with his phone out so that his mate Damien can siphon money from the hotel and wax poetic about just how great hacking is. We are the modern day magicians, siphoning bank accounts out of thin air. I wasn't aware that any magicians of any age did that. I thought that was robbers. Anyway, another hacker turns up. Hello. I think someone else is hacking in. Aiden gets a bit antsy and makes a run for it while Damien yells at him to stick around. And he sees a flash of something that will come up in more detail later, but for now is designed to spark questions that I'm not going to ask. Damien and Aiden Maurice, have hits put out on them. For the hackers in the Merlot job. You're assigned Aiden Pierce. And in an attempt on Aiden's existence, Aiden's niece is killed, triggering a 10 hour long whodunit that gets dull and sidetracked a couple hours in, and only really picks up around the 8th hour if you feel like waiting that bloody long. Also, bloody hell, Ubisoft loved the dead family motivation. Ezio, Connor, Jason, Brody. I think the reason I liked the bloke in Assassin's Creed 4 more than most was because at least his motivation was just getting ridiculous amounts of cash. I mean, I can relate to that. But Nice, that's a fucking new one. Like, they killed the brother in Far Cry 3, who was Grant, curiously enough. And they killed the parents in Assassin's Creed. I think someone just hates their fucking family at Ubisoft. Flash forward to 11 months later, and we're beating up the Trigger Man in Aiden's hit in a locker room beneath a baseball stadium. Maurice can't say who ordered the hit, but he does teach us how to aim our gun, which is terribly nice of him. How's your memory now? 
And when Aiden turns his back, he gives us a melee QTE that we're not allowed to fail. And I've seen that before somewhere. Aiden knocks him out, and then we leave into the tutorial proper. And here is Jordy. He's our somewhat zany, out there character. He's been put into the game to add some humour, but they forgot to actually add any humour. So he just kills shit and gives us exposition occasionally. His plan for an escape? Kill a bunch of gangsters, arrange their corpses tastefully, and then call the cops right to our location so they can deliver us to a stealth tutorial. I called the cops. You did. Oh yeah, true story. We tell Geordie to go take Maurice hostage somewhere, and then we go and sneak through the police. The rest of this tutorial is about using cover, using our phone to hack, hacking into cameras for a better vantage point, and some basic crafting. Well, it's not like there's any actual complicated crafting, it's all just exactly what I just showed you with different components. And uh, for the rest of the game, that animation's not there, he just throws them together instantly. Yeah. Luckily you can actually fail in this tutorial, which is an okay benchmark for if a game handholds too much, but then the game actually kind of does handhold too much anyway. Also, Aiden can't help but stop to rob people here and there. We hack an access code, cause a blackout which blows up some lights and probably hurt quite a few people, and then we get out of the stadium and luckily Geordie has left us a car across the road so we can get our first taste of driving, and for reasons I'll get into later it isn't that much fun at all. Luckily the cops aren't onto us right away, giving us a chance to slip out unnoticed, so I just park a car in a back alley until they all bugger off, and then I drive out the search area. All while the chase music keeps blaring like shit's actually happening. We go back to Aiden's apartment, where he spends his time watching his sister from afar and plotting against a question mark. Yeah, fuck you question mark. Anyway, Bad Boy 17 gives us a ring about finding a backdoor into the CTOS network, which is a handy thing to have, I assure you. We've gained access to the CTOS backdoor while the police were being distracted by you. Bad Boy 17 is the character who handles all the boring hacker stuff that this game is about, while we play hacking minigames and do stuff every other action game has. We get a point, advancing us to hacker level 2 and showing us the expansive yet ultimately shallow upgrade system. It's a bunch of categories with some new abilities, only four things are really that helpful, and the rest are just kinda there. Hey look, dynamic shadows! And with that point spent, we get the objective, go to sleep. Which I nearly succeeded in last time I tried to play through this game. Aiden has a dream of his dead niece. Here is his celebratory handgun. I don't want to go anywhere. I want to go to party. No you don't, it's shit. So guys, everything that Aiden is going to do over the course of this game is because his niece is dead, okay? And Aiden laments that the one thing that gave him character is dead. We head outside, and Aiden spews some exposition about having access to CTOS facial recognition granting him access to information about everyone. You see, it's topical and about digital privacy and that. I need to get my mind off things. Lucky for me, this city's full of distractions. And they can't hide from me. Aiden takes his mind off of dead niece by beating up criminals. Luckily, and rather stupidly, CTOS can predict crimes before they actually happen. This instance makes slightly more sense because he picked it up by reading another person's phone. But in future, crimes are just dropped onto the minimap. Anyway, we detect crime happening in an alleyway nearby before it happens, beat up the criminal just as the crime begins, get some points, our morality bar gets a boost, and this hobby of Aiden's is never brought up again in the story. Because this is shit that Ubisoft is growing more guilty of with every free roamer that comes out. They add a side mission or activity to the main plot, treat it with a modicum of importance, and then it just gets dropped. It feels like padding, it takes away some discovery from the game, and it's also a bit of a gamble. If I play a side activity and don't enjoy it, now I have to sit and wonder if it's going to be put upon me later on in the plot. It's also problematic here because this is the start of the game, where we should be establishing the characters and the conflicts. Best part is, this isn't even the worst case of this in the game. 
but that comes up real soon. Now it's at this point that the city opens up to us. I can't speak for how well Chicago is realized in this game, as I've never been there. It's definitely a collection of streets, warehouses, and the occasional square. It just doesn't seem to have much character to it. There's no real landmarks that I can recall. There are a few areas that are more detailed than others, but that's typically because they have a mission set there. It's also a relatively small map, which I suppose is good for me as the driving in this game starts out awkward and slightly heavy. I got used to it, but I never really enjoyed it. Despite the map's relatively compact size, I did end up quick traveling a ton, and I'm certain that if the quick travel wasn't relegated to train stations and unlockable safe houses, that I'd have used it even more. All that said, the map does make ample use of your hacking abilities. There is not a street that goes by without at least one thing that could be hacked. So, the hacking is at least... well, utilized. Our first mission is going to meet Nikki, Aiden's younger sister. You see, it turns out that Dead Niece had a brother, a live mute nephew, and it's his birthday. Well, he's not really mute, he just refuses to talk to anyone but Nikki, which is all good by me and I encourage this behavior in all children. Nikki asks if Aiden is still chasing after criminals out of worry for herself. I just need to make sure that things are different. Things are different. Definitely different. This time I'm knowingly putting you in danger. We do all the usual birthday party things. Talk about feeling sick and your dad forcing a birthday cake on you. Standing in a hallway. Getting reminded of terrible things that should never have happened. Stealing medicine from your family. Then sister gets harassed this? over the phone. You think blogging caller ID will hide you? Aiden hacks into the conversation, confronts her about it, but she doesn't want Aiden to get involved because she's a fair bit smarter than him. But Aiden quickly scarpers so he can do something marginally more fun. Damn it. He's on the move. Aiden steals Wait, that was right outside her house. Did I just fucking steal her car? Did Aiden just grab her money? Did I just crash her car a couple of times? Okay, I've complained about driving a few times now. Let's go into some depth. First off, I'm on a PC, and WASD isn't exactly the best for driving controls. But it goes beyond that. You don't have to hold down the W key to maintain your speed. Instead, it essentially just turns up your speed. Taking your finger off the accelerator doesn't slow you down, and it takes a little bit of getting used to. Cars are also pretty heavy, and they turn slowly alongside that. As for hacking whilst driving, we start off with the ability to hack traffic lights. And over the course of the game, we get the ability to raise bollards, road spikes, raise bridges, and eventually blow up steam pipes beneath the ground. Because CTOS, the security system, for some reason goes into steam pipes beneath the ground. The issue I have, whilst hacking while driving, is that for the most part the game just turns it into a QTE. The button will say neutralize, a sound effect will play, and there is no point to ever use these abilities when it doesn't just give you that pop-up. It's essentially a constantly recharging instant kill move that's 100% effective, and it essentially means that traffic lights, raising bollards and road spikes, are all functionally the same thing. And considering that traffic lights are the most common trap anyway, it invalidates the later unlocks a little bit. Also, most of your instant win hacks are just plain disabled in scripted chases until the chase can reach a certain point. There are a few spots on the map where you can cut through a gated area, or unlock the shutters on a parking lot to take little shortcuts, but they're few and far between. This is a free roamer taking place in the modern day, and that means that there's a lot of driving, more so than hacking when compared. You're going after that creep, aren't you? Well... You're doing it right now! Hey look, Nikki's chastising us and Aiden is pretending he isn't chasing him. Stop being a hero, Aiden! Let well, he's really more of a cunt if you think about it. We break his car. We smack him with a club. Hack his phone and find out he was paid to harass Nikki. Aiden calls Bad Boy, and to cut a long story short, we need to do a side activity to advance the plot. We need to hit CTOS Center so we can find out who paid for Nikki's harassment. Now, a group called DeadSec tried attacking this place last month. They failed, and more guards were added. But if you haven't played Watch Dogs, you have no clue what sort of man Aiden Pierce actually is. First objective, and an actual objective in this game, Go to a gun shop and buy an assault rifle. What can I do the only things being sold in this game are cars, which are everywhere, crafting ingredients, which you'll never run low on if you don't spam craftable items as I do, cloves, which... Fucking Christ, Aiden, you need serious fucking help. They're all the same clothes in different colours, this at least makes a tiny bit of sense in Assassin's Creed, but you're not part of a hacking or- And guns. 
definitely most importantly guns. So we nab a 416 and head off to the CTOS station. Now, a good thing is that before most mission areas in the game you can hack cameras to get the lay of the land. The feature lifted from Far Cry 3 is the ability to tag guard so you'll always know their position. Stealth would be entirely standard if not for a couple of things. You can create lures which have 100% efficacy against the rather idiotic AI. You've got a stealth takedown move that looks like it should create a lot of noise. And some guards can be distracted by hacking into their phones or hacking nearby objects. Your phone can even blow pressure valves or blow up some of the scenery. And in some cases you can hack into their fucking grenades, which makes me believe that the person adding hackable objects was being paid by each hack added. Because who the fuck needed Wi-Fi enabled grenades? There are four shootout missions and four stealth missions, but for most of the game either approach is possible. The issue with this is that stealth is more time consuming for less tangible benefit. The takedown gets us the same amount of XP as a headshot. Enemies drop more ammo than you'll use, and they drop cash too. And going loud just summons more of these wonderful XP dispensers. Aside from a few missions with cops, you're not even putting that morality bar at risk. Even when killing security guards. It's so skewed towards combat. As for the combat itself, it's ultimately fine. It's your standard cover based shooting with hacks put on top to give it an attempt at a sense of identity. Biden controls well, he has a sense of weight without feeling sluggish, and he animates wonderfully, darting between cover, rolling during near hits. He has a fluidity that you can sometimes see when you're not spending 90% of your time in cover popping out to shoot things. The combat is simple in nature, if a little easy thanks to enemy AI and regenerating health. It can even be fun here and there, but it does not hold for the length of the game. But, let's go back to the opening cutscene. Aiden runs at the presence of one other hacker. His weapon of choice is an extendable baton and the first thing we do in the game is fake shooting someone. Aiden is introduced as a sneak who goes into hiding the moment he's caught out. All we know is that he's a hacker who's trying and failing to look inconspicuous. So why is he so fucking powerful? I'm pretty sure that before the 10th mission of the story he has killed well over a thousand people without breaking a sweat. Look at that weapon wheel. This ain't fucking Far Cry 3, no four weapon limits. He has all of his goddamn guns on him all the time. He has several thousand rounds of ammunition and perfect accuracy with everything he grabs. As the game goes on he gains the ability to craft fucking grenades, IEDs and proximity bombs. And he builds them with no delay. He wills them into existence and in great fucking numbers. Before the end of the first act, I have three assault rifles, four shotguns, two sniper rifles, one anti-material rifle, two grenade launchers with loads of ammo, six handguns, and a submachine gun for when I feel like being subtle. Which is never, because I can carry all of this at the same time. I'm pretty certain that I caused the most explosions I've ever caused in a game during my playthrough of Watch Dogs. Because I swear my grenade launcher ammunition refreshes between missions. Then Aiden also gets fucking bullet time. Because we've already snapped any chance at the enemies being a threat over our collective knees, so why not? Just have some slow motion as well. The problem I have with this is that unlike other Ubisoft protagonists, we have no clue why Aiden is just so bloody lethal. And it clashes with what little characterization we get. He has access to the security network that controls everything in the entire city as well. Aiden is, rather inexplicably, the most powerful protagonist Ubisoft has ever created. It isn't like Assassin's Creed where we understand why the protagonists are as skilled as they are, or Far Cry 3 where Jason becoming a violent murderer is the central arc, and one other characters are very much privy to. Here, he's just a god with guns, don't question it. He's mysterious, and Ubisoft hopes interesting. Another problem is that combat elevates very quickly within the first quarter of the game, and then has nowhere to really go. So it gets plodding and tedious before the halfway point, then remains as such for the rest of the game's run. Now, I'm going to suggest some shit to make stealth satisfying and worth a damn, make combat have some actual challenge, and make preparation and hacking worth a damn. I realise that Ubisoft is scared of actually challenging people playing their games, you know, hence why you can beat most Assassin's Creed games just by punching everyone. But how OP Aiden is is just bloody ridiculous. Okay, so games like Doom, Painkiller, Serious Sam, these shouldn't have weapon limits. Watch Dogs should. The only real preparation you do for missions is looking at them through cameras before going in and easily crushing all resistance beneath Aiden's mighty boot. Make it so that Aiden can only stow away small weapons like handguns, 
or at most a submachine gun. If you want to carry a two-handed weapon, you either have to grab one from an enemy, or buy one and lug it to the mission. Carrying a big gun could slow you down, or make it harder to trigger hacks as a balancing act for the greater firepower. Aiden also carries all of his bombs and crafted hacks on him at all times. Fuck that noise. You have to pick and choose before you head on in. No more Aiden the super terrorist. Now Aiden, just the regular, easily prepared terrorist. If you want to craft on the mission, you have to crouch down and throw that shit together. And it takes some time as well. The next three go hand in hand in a way. Lower the enemy count for much of the game, increase the amount of damage Aiden takes, and replace regenerating health with a craftable health item. Now Aiden is actually an underdog who has to conserve resources, scrounge for bigger guns, and actually take note of enemies. Now stealth is viable and combat is a fullback and not done as a matter of course. Aiden's image is that of a man with a handgun and a phone. Hacking should have been his one advantage over his more readily equipped enemies, his sole bit of leverage. As it is, Aiden is an unstoppable force of destruction who has no qualms about creepily reading your text messages. I mean, you've already stolen ideas from the Souls series, which I'll get to in a second. Steal some design elements from Max Payne 3 and The Last of Us while you're at it and you could make this game more interesting. Saving one little detail for last, and one of my favourite things to note about the stealth in this game, enemies only enter alert mode when they make line of sight with the player. If they can only hear you, they just go into a sort of caution mode. This means it's entirely possible to remain sneaking while killing every guard with an M107. Which, for those who don't know, is a big-ass rifle designed for shooting at tanks. To put it mildly, it's not terribly quiet. With all that said, let's go back to the CTOS Center. As you've no doubt guessed, Aiden easily murders all the security guards at this security station. And no cops are coming despite the fact that all security is dead at this security station. I hack the phone with the access code, and I play a trite minigame to access the CTOS center. Just connect the beginning and end by spinning this shit round. In these parts, they leave a couple of videos you can hack into, just to show you that they have eyes everywhere. They represent the civilians they watch with skulls. They also kick puppies and push old women downstairs because they're just that evil. We hack in, and get complete access to the loop. And if me and this game combined haven't bored you enough yet, let's talk about the backstory for the purposes of insulting CTOS. So, in 2003, a hacker causes a blackout that kills 11 people. So, a company called Bloom throws together CTOS, for the purposes of monitoring everybody. This system keeps tabs on their job, their salary, and a random little fact for funsies. I'm not sure why, but this only makes NPCs seem more lifeless to me. Somehow. Aiden having CTOS access on his phone allows him to see through cameras, raise bridges, change traffic lights, and make people's CTOS connected grenades explode all with the press of a button, and this is why streamlining can be a bad thing. Then we have DeadSec, a hacktivist group Bad Boy 17 is a member of, doing some shit in the background that Aiden doesn't really care about and I for once am inclined to agree with him. But to put it short, they oppose Bloom, CTOS, and the mayor of Chicago, because CTOS tracks everybody, everywhere, all the time, and due to that, it can predict crimes before they happen. But... I just shot up their fucking facility. Didn't see that coming, did they? Oh, I guess security cameras don't work on Aiden. Oh yeah, both in gameplay and story, cameras are entirely on Aiden's side. This goes beyond hacking, Aiden's a fucking technomancer or some shit. This is what Aiden looks like from a security camera. I'm sorry, but I'm pretty sure if you saw that shit on camera, you would at least go and have a peek. It's a man who can blur his face in real time. To add to the idiocy of the fact that CTOS can't find him, ordinary citizens recognize Aiden on site as the vigilante. Over the course of the game, you'll have tens of gun battles in the streets, both in the main story path and in the extra missions. It is probably the loudest and most public plot about a hacker that I've ever seen. CTOS is bloody stupid. It's an attempt to convey how invasive and powerful these digital security measures are, but they've essentially removed the player from the issue. I mean, think about similar modern free-roaming games like the Grand Theft Auto series and the Saints Row series. They're very wacky and they're over the top, and that lets us suspend our disbelief and let us believe that the characters get away with the shit they do. But Watch Dogs takes its story very seriously, and it's a very stupid story. It just makes it really hard to believe that Aiden gets away with half the shit he does. This shit's only exacerbated over the course of the story because we cause multiple blackouts. It seems CTOS only made it easier. So, um, yeah, back to that CTOS center I was talking about maybe 10 minutes ago now. Sorry for getting sidetracked, but this game does it worse. 
So now that we've done that, we have slightly more CTOS access than we did beforehand. This is a good thing, I can assure you. Geordie gives us a ring. He's hired us out as a driver in a job, because we need to stretch this shit out somehow. Well, it's not like I've got a call in this. I head over to the mission and... Well, 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 what's this? A fixer coming to kill us? I made too much noise in the loop. Compared to later missions that don't cause this to happen, and make what just happened seem a whisper in comparison. This is another side activity that's been thrown into the main plot, and this is probably the most egregious example going. This is the standout multiplayer mode of Watch Dogs. Only in this case it's a bot, because this is essentially a tutorial mission for a mode that I'm never required to play, that I might not also want to, or I might not have internet access. Regardless, it's basically hide and seek. Someone's trying to hack into your phone, but they can't leave an allotted area, and you have to scan them in time. I track down the bot and... Well, I guess that worked. This is where it gets incredible. The game at this point forces you to open the multiplayer menu. It's so proud of how it's dressed it up with some fancy language. Then the game makes you request a one-on-one -on -one hacker match. My immersion at this point is completely shattered beyond all repair. You can cancel out of it and the game will let you progress, but it's a catch-22 at this point. Aiden has stated that it is important that he tracks down another fixer, so if I cancel out of this the game just kind of sheepishly excuses it, and Aiden never brings it up again. Or as it did happen, I join another player's game, I failed, end up running for my life in a small chase which was admittedly pretty fun. I nab a car and manage to escape. and I get deposited further away from the objective that I was trying to do in the first place, only now it's open for some reason, and it will never be mentioned again. This all said, it's a fine multiplayer idea, breaking into another player's single player session. I want more things like this stolen from the Souls series. It's kind of funny when you realise that you can't pause when another player joins your session, which kind of gives the game away, but that aside, this is one genuinely good thing in Watch Dogs, and it's the only part of the game I would come back for. Online hacking hide and seek. That said, I didn't play the other modes. And to those couple of people who did join me just as I was quitting the game those couple of times, sorry about that, but I'm an impatient bastard. So, the game may have just gotten bored with the story and decided to play some multiplayer, but now we are back and heading to the driving job Geordie set us. The police are onto some bloke we need to pick up, so we have to be sneaky. This will be somewhat more challenging with the introduction of CTOS scans. They serve to make escaping the cops just a bit more annoying. See that circle on the minimap? We're not allowed to go there until it runs out, and I really appreciate it when they put them right above the objective. Late game, these things get really obnoxious, being called in in large numbers for minutes at a time. You do get jammers to buy some respite, and at times these things become necessary, especially when you have circles in every bloody direction and no way to build up enough speed to escape them. The condition for failure is very rarely an instant game over. It generally just triggers a police chase. In this mission, however, no such luck. We get to the bloke and start to slowly drive him out. I hope you have an invitation or you're dead. Shoot, 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 shoot. It's very much like stealth on foot, only we're in a car. There's only a handful of instances of this objective in the game. Which is a shame, as it's actually quite interesting, having to creep through alleyways, duck when a helicopter passes over, and quickly pass through main streets to keep out of sight. We drive him to Lucky Quinn, who is very obviously going to murder the bloke. Get a chance to talk to your mama? Call your friends? Your girl? Oh, sir. Then murders him. Boy, isn't he evil. Well, it doesn't matter right this instant, because right now he's an old man and killing that kid made him tired. So he's going to go and lay down for the next eight hours of plot. He'll wake up in time to be important near the end, though. Aiden spends the rest of the night sitting in his car, delivering exposition about Quinn and his criminal background. These assholes have been preying on Chicago since before I was born. I could have done the city a huge favor if I put one between his eyes. This is exactly what I've been trying to stay away from. Now you see, Aiden fucking loves exposition. He loves it more than life, he loves it more than his dead niece. It's all he has as a character. They're dealing in human organs. I know how it works. Cut them open, harvest the organs, and let them die. 
Listen to that exposition on how organ rings work. Okay, I gotta find some stolen car and reach a drop-off point. The trick is to avoid the cops. Aiden's expert criminal advice. When doing something illegal, don't get caught by the police. They don't like that sort of thing. Nearly all of Aiden's dialogue is so functional, but it makes him seem more simple than experienced. Speaking of shit that makes him look more simple than experienced, his design. The self-proclaimed iconic cap, the ridiculous coat that he's incapable of actually taking off. It's a design that wants to be inconspicuous. A practical, intelligent criminal. Designed by a twat with no concept of staying under the radar. The only part of Aiden's design I like is his choice of weapon, the extendable baton. It's such an underhanded looking weapon, and it suits Aiden really well. But the thing about Aiden is he dresses like a twat, acts like a cock, and has a voice roughly analogous to a lump of charcoal. He is meant to be unlikable judging from his actions, and that can work, but that would require I actually care about seeing him act out his goals, which I don't. The issue is, I don't care about any of the other characters so far either. It isn't dislike, it's apathy. We just got introduced to evil old mob man, and I can already see that he's an antagonist. We've got a wacky merc who just forced this boring job on us, and our sister and her thankfully quiet kid, and I already know what their function in the story is, and I'm just waiting on that kidnapping. Oh, and we have Maurice, our hostage, but he's not even that helpful, and Geordie's probably let him starve to death anyway. Oh, and Bad Boy 17, well, he's just sort of your average... I've got something for you. We need to meet. Oh, he wants to meet. And it turns out he's a French woman named Clara, who will in future try to act as a romantic interest, but thankfully this goes nowhere. I kinda sorta hate her design on sight because she's a shadowy behind the scenes hacker who's wearing her fucking logo. I mean, yeah, it's the CTOS skulls, but still, real fucking subtle. She also treats Aiden like he has a character, which kinda hurts her credibility if you ask me. Or maybe these Ubisoft games are too deep and I just don't get it. Anyway, she's actually just a plot and upgrade tree conduit because she puts more CTOS on our phone, which only had some CTOS before but now has more. This unlocks near enough the rest of the upgrade tree. Having CTOS access on our phone lets us be a better gunman, and shows us how to make IEDs, because CTOS is just the anarchist cookbook, writ large, I suppose. I use the points to buy an upgrade that lets me steal more money from the peasants, just so I can buy those bigger guns sooner and break the game. You really shouldn't have had a skill tree and just doled out upgrades slowly, but hey, if you want to let me fuck your game sideways, don't let me stop you. I'm sorry, I was rough before. I know what you were doing, trying to intimidate me. Very textbook. Stepping into my personal space, the stare, physical contact. You are trying to look for cracks. I wish Aiden tried to pull that shit on Quinn. Or to any other character at any other point in the game for that matter. So we've got CTOS access, but not enough CTOS access because the guy we're trying to track down has been bouncing his signal around. Getting that sent wasn't enough, but this just might do it. If we take out this office, then we'll be able to track down his signal. So we go there and easily murder everyone inside again. Play that mini game that's going to appear at least 30 more times, never becoming challenging, just playing longer. We pop in a virus that gives dead second Clara greater access to CTOS, and this time the police actually turn up. They're getting smarter. Okay, they don't actually bother to turn up, they send some CTOS scans as a sign of goodwill. Why? There is shooting coming from a downtown office building owned by a massive security firm. I'm no policeman, but I could hazard a guess at where the shooter might bloody well be. I drive away from the green police circles until they decide that this mass shooting was just not worth looking into. So, with our now even better CTOS access, Clara tracks down the position of the caller. The data flows are split. There must be two CTOS boxes. We go there, and we're introduced to the last type of puzzle. It's a line of sight puzzle. Got to see boxes to hack them using cameras. They're simple because typically only one or two elements in an environment can be moved at any time. Like this here lift. Got to lower that so we can see that box. Hack that. Head back to the original hacking point. Play another instance of the fucking Pipe Dreams minigame. Oh hey, it's Waxing Poetic Bloke from the intro. He's suffered too, just like the players. He wants to meet, but I've tripped an alarm and it's all a little bit awkward because that means fixers are coming to kill me. Oh yeah, that's another reason CTOS is fucking dumb. There's an army of fixers, basically mercenaries doing wet work in the middle of fucking Chicago, 
yet CTOS can't keep track of them, even though over the course of the story they have mass gun battles in the middle of the street. If one tenth of the gun battles that happened over the course of this game happened over the course of several years in the actual US, they would fucking shit themselves. Anyway, they're all dead because they went up against fucking Aiden. We get to waxing poetic hacker, and now he's bitter drunk hacker, Damien Brinks. Oh, and he brought champagne. Damien. Tell me you missed me. You had that punk call my sister. But Aiden sticks to being Aiden. You're also grim, Aiden. Well, I'd go with dull, but you're near the mark. Damien wants to work with Aiden to get answers, and the thing is, I completely fucking agree with him. Them working together would move this along faster and be mutually beneficial for both of them. Even if Aiden now hates Damien, he knows that he could only act in his interests. I guess the story needed some drama. That, and he's got an in as to who the Murloc hacker was. You got nothing I need. It just makes Aiden look like an obstructive twat, and has added about three hours of plot onto this mess. He turns him away because this game didn't get to its length by being clever. Want Aiden to look smart and keep Damien's new character of unhinged bitter drunk? It's simple, really. You switch this scene around. The early game is now Aiden tracking Damien down because he needs his skills. The man harassing Nikki has now been sent by the same people who put the hit on Aiden in an attempt to draw him out into the open. The Merlot. Mm -hmm. The Merlot was your fuck up. Bullshit. You bailed on a perfectly good scheme. Damien hates the fact that Aiden bailed on him and wants nothing to do with this conspiracy, and Aiden has to do shit to get him on board. That would have been more interesting, and probably made this game shorter, which I'm heavily in favour towards. There was a second hacker, and I know how to find him. Yeah, well, Aiden's never been a smart man. Aiden then walks five feet away from Damien, does some exposition, and basically admits he needs what Damien knows. You do realise you could have just pretended to be on his side to get what you wanted, right? You're nothing if not underhanded. Ah, oh, fuck it, Aiden's beyond help. I need to know what he's got on the Merlot. Hey, uh, that guy who harassed your sister, you know, who knows where she lives and shit, you just kind of sent him away and gave him ample reason to be more mad at you, you realise? You could have just, like, kept him at arm's length and that would have... Oh, fuck it. Oh god, if I keep this pace, this review's gonna take an hour of your life and years off mine. This is Act 1 of fucking 5, and this story slows itself down a number of times with missions that don't really add anything. Case in point, the mission right after Aiden essentially tells Damien to sod off. We head to the graveyard, where we get a flashback of Aiden and Nikki at the dead niece's grave. Nikki is handling her daughter's death way better than Aiden. Like, gold medal at the handling your kid's death Olympics. We've all suffered a horrible nightmare, but... You have to stop trying to fix it. She tells Aiden to stop because last time he did stupid shit like this, it put them both at risk. Aiden's argument is that she's alright because he protects her, but this is stupid cutscene Aiden, not universe stomping gameplay Aiden, so it rings somewhat hollow. But promise me you will stop. You'll lie to your sister, but not to the guy who could actually help you. Anyway, this grave scene has nothing to do with the mission. You got a problem. Survivor from the stadium. If that guy talks, he'll ID you. Survivor? How did that happen? I'm guessing he didn't die. Thanks for making me go to the graveyard first. Fucking miles away from my objective. This annoys me because you can come back here in free roam for a memory, which is essentially just a repeat cutscene. Just remove the cutscene from the plot, leave it here as an optional thing. The mission line now flows better and there's a nice surprise there. What did this cutscene even do? Let us know that Aiden's a shitty person? Make us wonder who's leaving flowers on dead niece's grave? Well, I already knew one and I don't care about the other. It's probably Quinn. Bet it's Quinn. Geordie has tied up a family so that he can snipe from across the river. You remember the stiff from the stadium? He's not so stiff anymore. The uh, cops got him in Chicago lockup and, oh, he's about to walk into an interrogation and point a finger. Right at you. To spoil exactly how this is going down, this guy knows a guy who knows another guy who knows me. So I've got to go through three different people. So that means three missions, about 20 minutes each. Great. If you go stealthy, he's entirely useless. If you go loud, he's slightly less useless. I go entirely stealth for the first part of the mission just to spite him. Aiden blackmails the other bloke into not talking, and he spills the beans on another guy who knows Aiden's identity. Hey look, it's the first helicopter battle of the game.
and there it ends. You see, this is why you manage when your weapon unlocks become available. If you don't, shit like this happens. We then kill all the people who didn't have a helicopter, and that's another mission in the bag. So at this point, all the elements for the rest of the game have been shown at least once, save the occasional side mission that gets jammed into the story. Shootouts, stealth, chases as both chasey and chaser, both types of puzzles, environment, and hacking. The issue is that the game's difficulty is at this point static. In fact, gun battles will only get easier as I get more firearms. The stealth too will collapse as I get greater access to phone hacks and lures. The combat is already starting to run out of steam, and I'm not even a quarter of the way into the game. I say this because at this point I'm going to speed the fuck up, both for your sake and for mine. So, we now know about some guy connected at a Chicago South Club called Angelo Tucci, who knows a guy who knows her identity. The South Club also has Quinn as a member, but Aiden is scared of attacking him, but not attacking Tucci. So, we go and trick his niece into giving up his location, then attack a convoy of cars in broad daylight, Good thing I've unlocked IEDs, and no one is suspicious of that red blinking light in the middle of the road. We run Angelo over, and this for reasons I forget stopped a prison transfer of the guy who knows her identity. So, a bloke in prison. There's only one way to get to him. Well, technically two, but Aiden doesn't actually realise he's more than capable of gunning his way through a prison. Aiden gets himself arrested. He walks into the prison wearing his stupid outfit, and his iconic stupid hat, which he'll continue to wear for the rest of the game after he breaks out. Freeze! Stop the gun! Well, if you want me to drop all of them, it's gonna take a while, officer. Jordy sneaks in his phone an extendable baton somehow. This could actually be a fun mission. It starts with a pretty strong puzzle where you actually have to ride the guard's cameras to the point where you can unlock your door with your hacks, and escaping from your cell block actually relies on genuine stealth rather than all of your gimmicks. Only some gimmicks. But the stealth is over in less than 10 minutes. Aiden breaks out of his cell, manages to escape his block, and find the prisoner in an underground guard torture ring within 10 minutes. At which point Aiden grabs a gun, starts a firefight under the sodding prison, we kill all the guards, get our first big enemy. We are like normal enemies, but they take more bullets. Upon taking these more bullets, they become dead, much like normal enemies. Then Aiden coerces the other bloke and sods off. Geordie sneaks in all of our guns, and our bloody outfit, and we ramp off the prison parking lot onto a train line and escape. That mission had potential for about 10 minutes before just devolving into normal watchdog's fare. I mean, that was the quickest prison section in a game I've ever seen. They had a perfect opportunity to have some stealth without us having access to all our normal gimmicks, but no, uh, fuck it. And you know what the best part is? I'm using a wiki to recall shit that happened this early in the game. Thanks people who actually like this game, you're a real help. I couldn't remember Angelo Tucci, or the family that, you know, Geordie kidnapped, but I was there for them. The 14 fucking hours of footage I recorded proves it. Uh, I've got less than 100 years on this earth. Probably half that, if I'm lucky. And this ends Act 1 of fucking 5. And Act 2 is the longest and most boring. Now, let's do something stupid. Let's break from the story and do some side content. I mean, it's a free roamer after all. But, here's my advice for playing a Ubisoft free roamer. Do the side content last. Get the story out of the way. And if you still want more, then go for the side content. Doing it mid-story just further wears the game down. And you want that ending, right? Well, maybe not, but I'm an idiot, and for quite a lot of Act 1 and 2, I was exploring and sampling the side missions. What did I waste my time doing, you ask? Well, chess. Chess is fun, but Ubisoft doesn't get any credit for that. And the guy you play against needs to shut the fuck up. Go. You're in check. Please. Go on. Great job. Please. Proceed. Well played. He talked so often that I ended up killing him. Well, there are multiple versions of him, but I killed that one. Fixer contracts. Basically side missions. These include trite driving missions, like checkpoint races and such. I get more than enough driving in the main plot, so I think you can tell how I feel about this. The on-foot fixer side missions, however, are semi-decent. There's convoys, where you find a group of criminals driving around and blow them up, all while CTOS ignores it. Then there are gang hideouts, which is Watch Dogs at its best, actually. It uses stealth, hacking, and action all together. There's a bloke in a location surrounded by guards, and you need to identify him and knock him out. You're not allowed to kill him. 
Getting spotted makes him far harder to melee, as he gets a bit shooty when he sees you running at him with a stick. So it actually allows shooting while penalizing it. You need to hack and prepare ahead of time so you know who to go after and who to avoid. This is a glimpse at what Watch Dogs could have been with more interesting level design and gameplay balancing. There are some hidden objects around the world, like weapon stashes, which open up side stories about weapon traffickers, an organ ring and a human trafficking ring. I'm not insane enough to want any more story out of this game, so I didn't pursue it. We've got digital trips. They're alright little diversions. We've got psychedelic, which is by far the silliest and most light-hearted. Just bounce on flowers for points. The controls unfortunately are too rigid to make it very much fun on the PC. There's Madness, which is more driving with more explosions. There's Alone, which is all atmospheric and has stealth in that. There's Spider Tank, which has more right to be a full-fledged game than Watch Dogs does. Crush police, blow up shit, do some objectives. Oddly enough, each of these diversions have their own small skill trees. Why they have that little extra bit of depth, I couldn't say. They don't gel with the rest of the game whatsoever. Then there's Drinking, the most pathetic side mission in any piece of interactive media ever. Just look at this. Aiden, you haven't even drunk yet. No one has this much trouble drinking. You suck so fucking much, I can't believe it. There's also the random crimes and your reputation meter. Now, I never had problems with the reputation meter. You wanna know why? Solving one crime gives you enough points to remain on the side of good, up until you run over in excess of 10 civilians. The most neutral karmic rank is civilian. I'm assuming this is because the average American citizen runs over at least 10 people. Even shooting cops doesn't immediately put you below neutral. Shooting security guards and militia members out in the countryside is completely A-OK. -okay. It's only worth as an addition is that being on low reputation causes civilians to call the police at the sight of you. So I just kept it in the positive as a matter of course. Other than that, its addition doesn't really do much. It's not affected by me stealing large sums of money from the populace. You know, just by walking down the street and hacking into their phones. Aiden calls it the hero tax. Uh, Aiden might simultaneously be the most boring and yet the most slimy protagonist I've ever seen. He kind of perfectly encapsulates Watch Dogs itself in a way. Bland yet slimy. Another problem with random crimes is, if you stop the crime too early, it doesn't count as a good deed. Even though from my perspective, I've not only stopped the crime, but I've also saved the victim from mental trauma. We can also go after CTOS centers and CTOS towers. Towers are those little line of sight puzzles with cameras, much as we've seen in the main story. Doing either of these unlocks more quick travel points and reveals where everything on the map is in that area. Exploration and discovery be damned. It also lets us hack into buildings to watch videos of mundane depression. Yeah, that's your reward. Boring voyeurism. You know what? You know what I was thinking? You know what I think would be great? How about, you know what, I move home for a little bit. Like, maybe, 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 maybe for good. That would be, <laughs> that'd be great. Every side mission has unlocks if you're willing to repeat it ten fucking times, which makes them feel like busy work in very short order. I couldn't imagine 100% of this thing, first of all. It's an expansive sandbox by virtue of the fact that once Ubisoft puts in a thing, they figure they may as well put it in again ten, maybe twenty times with minor variances. So, I'm now at the beginning of the most boring section of the story, and I've drained what fun I'm going to get from the side missions. I don't care much for the extra unlocks anyway. More guns would only be window dressing by this point. I've already got an arsenal on hand at all times. So, swiftly moving on. Well, swift as this review is. Now we have to go meet Damien at a plaza, but he's not there, so he gives us a ring. And look at that lip sync. It's like he's trying to chew his own face off and end it all. Anyway, uh, Damien's kidnapped sis in possibly the dummiest, uh, dummiest? Possibly the dummiest and showiest manner possible. He tells us to hurry over, but there's no time limit, so I'm alright. It kind of tells me that Sis is already kidnapped, extending the plot by three, maybe four missions. He played me. That son of a bitch played me, and I let him. Wait, 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 wait. How the fuck did he play you exactly? I mean, he was getting your attention by harassing your sister, and was his plan that you would blow him off? Surely it'd be better if he just kidnapped her first. This is possibly the worst play I could ever imagine. 
Well, Aiden, I'm going to take a guess and assume that he's going to kidnap her, and maybe her kid, so that he can make a big chunk of Act 2 about getting you to steal a hard drive connected to the Merlot incident at the start of the plot that you blew him off about, which will introduce another whole faction into the plot that has fortified a tower block and named it Rossi Fremont, being led by a man who's named Iraq, and no, I'm not joking. If that doesn't sound long enough for you, Clara is going to get you to track down a paranoid, surprisingly athletic homeless man so you can get a remote that allows you to turn a bridge around to access a forgotten CTO's facility called the Bunker. Did you find Tobias? Because despite what gameplay tells you, you can't just use a fucking boat. Oh, and this abandoned CTO's bunker? That the rest of the CTO's system doesn't notice is suddenly fully operational. Undetected access. Well, isn't that convenient. So, now you've got even more access to the system that's only vaguely explained how that slightly helps. Anyway, all that happens over the course of four or so incredibly boring hours. Yeah, I'd be threatening, I guess. Anyway, Mute Nephew managed to run off and is hiding on a train. There is a very good reason for why that you'll learn later. Just as Fixers turn up to nab him, I hack the train and send him on his way. Oh yeah, you can hack trains too. Kill all the Fixers in another gunfight ignored by the prediction computer. We recover Mute Nephew and drop him off with his psychologist. She'll call occasionally to ask where his mother is, but it's all a bit of an embarrassing story, really. As for Rossi Fremont and Iraq, Aiden declares early on, Never breaking alone. Because this dilapidated building has a high-tech metal security door. Never mind, it's dilapidated and I've got at least five IEDs on me at all times. And about five seconds after he says that, he murders everyone outside the fortress with no trouble whatsoever. This leads into a very tedious mission where we ride cameras through the facility to learn the lay of the land. It's a glorified cutscene at best, but if you miss one of the cameras attached to the guards, it takes fucking ages for them to reset their circuit and allow actual progression. Hey look, they downgraded Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon so they only need three buttons for arcade parity. Then we do the same riding the camera shit later on, only we've blackmailed a fat gangster named Bedbug to plant a bug in the facility for us in a subplot that I assure you was several missions long, and had us killing well in excess of about 1,000 gangbangers. You'll have to trust me on that. It also had tailing missions, because we didn't get enough of them in AC4. Bedbug is caught just after we get enough data to move the plot along, though. Not enough to end it right this second, however. Bedbug and Aiden get some of the best banter in the game, sadly. Aiden actually has a somewhat good contrast with him for all the one mission where they actually speak to each other somewhat casually. Computers through there. Why are you doing this, man? This, this ain't your world. It's complicated. We got plenty of time. Iraq was involved in something that hurt my family. I want answers. That ain't so complicated. Also, the camera stealth mission is actually a decent idea. It pops up twice over the course of the entire game. Mission 2 of Act 2 also has the second juggernaut enemy of the game, five hours in. The funny thing is, is that by the time I encounter him I've already become far too well equipped for him to be anything more than a stopgap, because I've got a fully automatic 12 gauge shotgun and a pump action grenade launcher. The game can stop calling them threats at this point. Oh yeah, another thing happens during Act 2. Fixers attack our motel and try and kill Aiden and Clara. But that's a drop in the bucket at this point. I think the problem overall with Act 2 is largely rooted in the fact that Act 1 ramps up far too quickly. In most missions we kill tens of people out in public, and if the first 200 enemies of the game aren't a threat, I'm not going to be terribly worried about the next 200. Act 2 is where I seriously wanted to stop playing because the story is plodding along. The gameplay has ceased to actually evolve, and the sparse enjoyable moments are becoming fewer and further between. The gameplay is always competent and never becomes out and out bad but it's safe and uninteresting and Act 2 is watchdogs at its most mundane. It's the setup for Rossi Fremont, the kidnapped sister, Lucky Quinn, CTOS and DedSec. It's been setting up story elements for about six hours and I have not resolved one thing. You'd think that in six hours the story would have resolved at least one issue, but instead all we've got to show for it is a bunker that helps for reasons I don't exactly get. Another problem is that during this act we're still getting tutorials. There is very little actual discovery in this game. Very few things you're capable of doing don't have some attached tutorial. We get a crafting tutorial, which is mandatory and forces us to buy crafting ingredients, even though I've already been crafting for ages and had access to quite a few of the crafting recipes. We have an IED tutorial, even though in-game I had already unlocked and been making rather liberal use of IEDs. And it also still forces us to open CTOS centers to unlock further missions at this point in the story. Even though we have a facility with... Undetected access. Here's a thought. Let me choose whether or not to unlock these. Give me a gameplay detriment if I don't. Restrict my hacks. Lessen the information on the minimap. 
make unlocking these things have a tangible benefit beyond just locking out further missions. So, on to Act 3, and thanks to Bedbug we have some data, but Clara can't decrypt it. This demands that we get the man who made CTOS so that he can decrypt it for us, Raymond Kenny, who's only now being brought up in the actual plot, because he's a hacker level 12 as opposed to Aiden and Clara, who are only level 7 abouts. Issue is, he's a whistleblower, and he caused the 2003 blackout that killed 11 people, so he's in hiding, but we found his signal and tracking it down alerts thousands of other fixers who spring out of the woodwork to provide a shootout for us. With all of them dead, we discover he's in Pawnee. You're done! Pawnee! Pawnee? That's the best you could come up with, Ray. Look, I told you it was a shithole. What did Aiden's niece want to come here for anyway? Did she want to be a militia member? Because all that's out here is a CTOS center, an on-the-run hacker and several hundred militia members who are guarding CTOS stuff. In Pawnee, we do very much the same thing we've been doing in Chicago. Killing hundreds of people, hacking things, or holding Q down on things. Tailing a helicopter, oh shit, that was a tailing mission. Oh, and uh, we do meet Raymond Kenny and... Well, he makes us play the drinking minigame as a story mission. But it's alright, it's instantly forgiven because he beats up Aiden afterwards. Then drags him to his scrapyard, which he has made shit like this in. There's one actual stealth mission in the bunch as well, where we sneak into a Bloom facility to clear Raymond Kenny off their database, because he has a chip in his head that detects him when he gets close to CTOS stuff. In there we see Damien through a security camera, making a deal with Bloom. He's offering to give up Raymond Kenny to CTOS, give up one man who killed 11 people, and in return he's asking for complete access to the CTOS system. I'm not going to recheck my footage to confirm that it doesn't end with the woman in the room laughing in his face, because I sincerely hope it does. Anyway, Bloom knows where Kenny is anyway somehow, so we have to defend his compound filled with fire-spewing robots and electro-spiders from hundreds of militia members before dragging him back to Chicago. Despite starting with a story-mandated version of that fucking drinking minigame, it's actually far better than all of Act 2 put together, and about half as long. With Kenny in Chicago, Aiden lets slip about Damien and Bloom. Working on a deal of his own. Something with Bloom. You never told me that. Then refuses to very easily summarize the situation to Kenny, so he knows just how little of a problem he actually is. Kenny continues to work for us despite Aiden's secrecy, and opens up the door to Rossi Freeman, and Aiden does something that could have been done four fucking hours ago if I had my way. We gun down everybody inside the building, grab all the data, then we chase Iraq out onto the rooftop and fight him. Despite being an ordinary man, he's capable of taking about five shots to the head, which coincidentally is exactly the number of shots needed to think this game is of any genuine value. So now that we have the data, Aiden could go and get his sister back. But someone realised that if that happened, this game would only be 39 missions long instead of 43. So in a panic, they added the character of default. We do. Follow that signal back. If we can find the source, kill his access. Hurry. This is this minigame in the late game. It never gets harder, it just gets longer, like I said. They had time limits, but they're always incredibly lenient, and I had long since just started shutting my brain off whenever one of these appeared. This minigame really is just a fix-all solution to whatever hacking needs to be done in the plot, isn't it? Default steals all the data and leaves a stupid Shh, message. Can you trace it? Yeah. Also, Default plays a message that shows Clara was hired to track Aiden and there's a bit of a falling out, so she's just gonna go leave and wait by dead niece's grave until her death later on in the game, and that will fail to motivate me to hate the villains any more than I'm already bored by them. Also, Damien gives us a ring because he wants the data now. Ooh, this is a bit awkward. Not a peep. This time, we're gonna meet. In person. So, Aiden goes to the meeting, and both of them realise they're at a stalemate. Damien can't hurt Nikki without losing Aiden, and Aiden can't get Nikki without giving up the data. Well, he can and he will, but that's not for several missions yet. So Damien acknowledges that he needs Aiden, then he broadcasts his identity to the news, in a scene that's actually pretty interesting where every civilian will call the cops on sight. So I cause a blackout, run for a bit, destroy the truck that's broadcasting that news report, but this isn't without the police finding me because, you know, they've decided for once to scan for more than two minutes before giving up on catching a dangerous criminal. But do you want it to know how I escaped that police chase? In fact, this works with 100% certainty. You ride a fucking train. I hop on the train, 
deactivate a chasing helicopter with my phone, and smoothly sail out of there. Don't even need to buy a ticket. The AI does not know how to handle a player jumping on a train at all. However, the fallout of this one interesting mission is four boring missions tracking down default. You end up at a downgraded version of the E3 demo, which is little better than a new grounds hidden object game. Just look at everyone's phones until the mission lets you progress, while the useless phones shoot unfunny and occasionally meme messages at us. Then we chase Default out onto the street and kill him. To the game's credit, Default did actually annoy me, yet killing him felt pretty empty. There's no real catharsis to it. On that note, there is one thing I like about this game. I'm glad they didn't try to put anything into the game with any genuine humour value, as that would have clashed with the tone. I thought you want to know, I've never seen a contract with more zeros on it than yours. They want you bad, pal. That's nothing new. So, you're gonna betray me before the game is done. Yeah, alright, cool, I don't really like you that much anyway. You cleaned up the audio I sent. Have a listen. So, Ray manages to figure out where our sister is held via magic. So we rescue her, make her murder a man. Well, it gets easy after the first million. In Watch Dogs tradition, we then proceed to murder everyone within 100 feet of Nikki. We go get her kid and shoot them out of the plot with a stealth driving mission to Pawnee. The cops are on the lookout for us, and getting caught is an instant game over. This mission is relatively difficult. So you know what I use to escape? Train lines. I'm not following you anymore. Good! Then we discover that the files we stole from Rossi Fremont was blackmail on the mayor, Bloom, and some other poor sods. If you're bored at this point, I assure you, I've been bored for a while. A big part of this is I know exactly how much longer there is left to go. The game makes a point of telling me how many missions I've done and how many are left after each mission. The progress screen also tells me what everything unlocks, and how much of everything I need to do to get it. I like games to have a stat screen typically, with a few interesting bits and bobs, but this is the opposite of fun to me. There are no surprises left in the game whatsoever. Telling me the number of missions left as a matter of course just seems so clinical and sterile. The game at this point already feels like busy work. At first I wasn't happy that the game had told me its exact length from the outset. In fact, flashed the information in my face. I felt it hurt the story by letting loose some of the tension it could have had. As I got to the halfway mark, I started to hate it because it reminded me there's still so much more to fucking go. Leave some mystery in your game, because discovery is fun. I assure you, however, it's almost over. There's been around 10 hours of this drivel, not counting side missions and shit. So, everything that has happened comes back to the Merlot, which we discover is owned by Quinn. Quinn's got some charity thing going on. At his hotel. Okay, why the actual fuck didn't Aiden know that Quinn owned that hotel? Shouldn't that be public knowledge? And shouldn't that be really fucking pertinent knowledge for a man who's planning to steal from it? Something that one might want to look into before you rob a place is whether a member of the fucking mob owns it. You know what, fuck it. Aiden deserves everything that comes his way. This plot should have been resolved a hell of a lot faster. If Aiden thought about maybe seeing who ran the hotel... You know, just to see who the fuck might have sent hitmen after him, after he got caught hacking at that hotel. So anyway, Quinn's holding a benefit gig for the mayor at his hotel, the Merlot, the hotel that Aiden was caught hacking in. We hack in again to watch the benefit, and afterwards come to learn that Quinn has the mayor in his pocket with some of that good old blackmail. Now, this time I'm in charge of Aiden, so this job at the Merlot ends a lot bloodier. I think one was enough with that rifle, Aiden. You can calm down, mate. There's a moment where Aiden gets in a lift, becomes cutscene Aiden, and is captured. But gameplay Aiden forces his way to the surface and proceeds to kill everybody at the hotel all the way to Quinn's panic room. Maybe there was a scene where Aiden got captured, but the guy writing got bored, I don't know. So he just decided, fuck it, just let him go. Who cares? Where it's revealed that Aiden's niece was killed basically because Damien stumbled upon the file being used for blackmail before the connection was cut. Quinn somehow engineered an affair between the mayor and some woman, then got footage of the mayor killing her, and that happening was all part of his plan somehow. Oh, he's pretty clever, that Quinn. 
Then we hack his pacemaker and watch him die in what is actually a pretty decent bit of gameplay and story integration. However, a mob boss connecting his pacemaker to the CTOS system, ran by Bloom and the police, cements him as by far the most ballsy character in the entire game. Then we have to get out of the hotel within a time limit or three guards of which I've killed millions bust in and we get a game over. Okay then. So we get out of the hotel within that rather strange poorly explained time limit. We have a police chase where I decide to take it easy on the cops and genuinely escape without using the train lines. And that's all but the final part of the mission under my belt. One funny thing about the first part of this mission is that in gameplay we find numerous messages telling Aiden that there are fixers heading for Clara, you know, to kill her. But he makes no mention of them whatsoever. It's like a bizarre dramatic irony where the player knows something that the character doesn't whilst he's actively reading it. So, like I said, Clara is busy being shot by fixers at the graveyard. Aiden finds out and hey, he wants in on that shit. Did you forget? We're not partners anymore. All bets are off. He rushes over there and distracts her for a second so that the fixers can line up a good shot. She gets killed, I kill the fixers, and Aiden walks away sad. I can tell it's sad because pathetic fallacy has kicked in. It's also a really bad scene when the death of a character has me laughing more than anything else. I'm pretty sure that even Aiden himself is stifling a chuckle. Luckily it's probably muted under the sad piano music that's being pumped in to tell us what we should be feeling. There's also something oddly hilarious about the fact that the quick travel interrupts the music, only for it to kick back in again when the game loads in. It's the final sodding mission. Aiden releases the tape of the mayor murdering a woman, rendering all that blackmail useless. Raymond is leaving and Damien is pissed. Oh, and he's gained full access to CTOS, so we have to race to the for some reason empty lobby of Bloom headquarters while Damien blows up pipes under city streets. Damien blocks access by rigging the hacking minigame, so we need to get time boosters by racing to three points across the map. What follows is a large-scale police chase, while the whole city fucking explodes around us. The cops, for some reason, are only concerned about us. The issue is, I'm just bored by it. There's police everywhere, everything in the city is exploding, cars are crashing, there's constant screams, there's helicopters, and I'm not having fun. Because over the 15 plus hours I've spent with this game, I have been driving for the majority of it. I didn't like it at the start, I don't like it now. I can't cowed out and ride the train lines this time. This mission is basically capture points with long driving segments between each point. There is a somewhat interesting interface screw in the mission with Damien fucking with the GPS. I guess that's alright. Over the course of the mission I kill a million cops while capturing the three nodes, yet I'm still only a citizen by the end of it all. So, over the course of 25 minutes, I slog my way to each point, capture it, then head on back to Bloom. DeadSec ring up asking for 30 seconds to put in their code, securing them inside CTOS. But Aiden says no, so that there can be some extra drama when there's a sequel. So we hack in, and this time the game isn't dull and impossible, just dull and possible. We hack into a satellite and power down the whole city. then head off to the lighthouse that Damien's hiding in. There's a confrontation, Geordi shows up but the game is bored so it kills him off before he can extend it yet again. Damien is shot in the head and the credits roll. They show several news clip epilogues. A live nephew's babysitter psychologist is writing a book about Aiden's psychology. I assume it will be rather short. DedSec declares open war. And, most stupidly of all, CTOS is declared a success. Now, I realise that is Bloom twisting the facts, but if you have a team of spin doctors who can cover up everything that happened over the course of this game, you wouldn't be running a security network. You would be Emperor of the Universe. So sod this game. There's meant to be another bit where we go and get a choice whether to shoot the bloke we kidnapped in the stadium at the start, but mercifully the game locked up as the credits ended. So I'll just say in my version of events that he actually did starve to death. I think it's pretty obvious. I really dislike Watch Dogs. I've just told an abridged version of the story. I've included as much as I could remember from my recordings and my 34 pages of notes on the game. But I've still missed shit out. 
There's a bloody human trafficking ring somewhere in that plot that I'd forgotten about until after I finished my summary. How the fuck is something so boring that I could forget that? The story is dull and overly long. The combat gameplay doesn't hold for nowhere near 15 hours. The driving gameplay doesn't hold for 15 minutes. The hacking is little more than an overlay that's been placed on top of a tired third-person cover-based shooter that has occasional stealth. I'd even say hacking is just a jumped-up version of Assassin Summoning from Brotherhood. Just less effective. This game should have not been delayed for polishing. It should have been delayed for pruning. It would have benefited from scaling back. Gunfights with small armies should not have been happening within the first couple hours of gameplay. It ramped up too much near the beginning, and it couldn't really go anywhere for the rest of its length. It instead just sluggishly trundled to a conclusion, kinda like this review did. It's an incredibly arrogant game besides. Declaring the characters clothing iconic, a myriad of special editions, the review embargoes and the repeated delays, and even more so on the Wii U. So, to end off this review, don't buy Watch Dogs. If you've made the same mistake as me and you've already bought it, don't buy its fucking DLC. And unless Watch Dogs 2 is somehow an Assassin's Creed 2 level of improvement, sod that game as well.